I think the chance to come and talk to a group of plant scientists is attractive to me. Dale's referred to work that I've done earlier on um, and the concerns that I have. And so I'm going to sort of focus on some of these issues today. It's not much in terms of plant science. And um, one of the points that I sometimes make is that I have this sort of, given that I have the rather strange job of being responsible in the UK government for all science and engineering in the UK, um, my normal speaking plan is that I tend to actually be speaking to audiences who know vastly about more about the subject I'm speaking to than I do. Um, this is not to demean this audience, but to say that um, Last month, when I was speaking to a group of laser physicists who were working out how you could use lasers to concentrate and generate nuclear fusion, I felt slightly more nervous than I do today, but this is not to demean you all. Um, let me get into the meat of it. As Dale said, I pointed out about three or four years ago that there were some basic um, world trends that were leading to a problem, which I termed a perfect storm, of the need for food, water and energy security and somehow dealing with climate change. And to an extent, I'm going to revisit that theme. And then in some sort of slavish attempt to become popular, um, I will then talk about plant science. In an odd way, um, the next 20 years are really determined because there are three or four key drivers that whatever happens now won't change. The first one is climate change, which I can, um, well, I'll come back to a little later, which is the sort of fundamental delays in the climate system mean that the greenhouse gas concentrations that are actually already up there will drive climate for the next 20, for the next 20 years or so. The second one is on population, um, in which effectively um, population growth, and I'm going to expand on these uh, a little later, population growth is pretty much determined. Um, it uh, certainly for the next 15 years or so. And urbanization, which is a trend, uh, last um, 2010 was the first year that the population of the world living in cities exceeded those living in rural areas. So these are three trends. And the fourth trend, which is also um, there, is that actually, despite significant poverty, the world's getting more prosperous. The number of uh, people, particularly in South Asia, who are entering what we might call the middle classes is enormous. So with that, there is an increasing tendency for consumption and that people will want more. They will want more, not de uh, better food products, better um, access to water, access to energy, but also access to consumer products. So all these are key trends. Now I'm going to go through a few of them in a little more detail. Let me just start with population. Last October, give or take a week or so either side, because these beware spurious accuracy, but last October uh, saw the popula world's population reach 7 billion. Projection uh, now is for, by 2025, a further billion people will come. And if you look at the graph on the left, you'll see where that's going to come. And primarily, it's gonna, that growth is going to come from Asia and from Africa. And I want to and give or take that extra billion is going to mean 500 million more Africans and 500 million more Asians. That is, I feel, a startling statistic. Uh, in particular, it's startling in Afri context of Africa, which currently has about a billion people um, and will therefore increase by 50%. In Asia, 4 billion or so at the moment and will therefore be increasing by significantly less proportionally. So, um, that's the first major demographic change. Now, I showed the, this is a deterministic graph, but I think it's important to actually focus also on the variation around that. The graph I showed previously was what you might call the best bet. Um, but demography is really fairly largely determined. And even if you say and look at the, um, the upper and lower, lower uh, um, graphs here, indicating changes in female fertility, give or take, even with big variations in female fertility, the population size is pretty much determined out to 2025 or 2030 or so. Um, the variation between um, uh, what you might term an optimistic view of, of female fertility and a pessimistic view won't make much difference in the next 13 or 15 years. 
it, it will make an enormous difference in, uh, in the, as we move through the 21st century. And one of the sort of, um, I could give this talk and saying why, why government need, why the world needs plant science, but I could also say why the world needs uh, sensible demography and sensible attitudes. Um, if we do not address uh, the issue of fertility, and I think we're at a cusp now, tipping point, if you will, if you want the jargon, I think we're at a tipping point where there is a potential that if the issues of fertility are not addressed, we'll be looking at a world in which not, we will be having 10 plus billion people well before the end of the century. Now, it's another talk and it's not about plant science, but the we know really what are the mechanisms that drive female fertility. One is prosperity, and as I said, the world is getting somewhat more prosperous, but not in major pockets. It's also, uh, we know that it involves uh, the education of women, um, very, very clear evidence to show that, and we also know that uh, it involves um, the availability of family planning. These are the real drivers that have got to be uh, start to invest in in a much greater way than we have hitherto. So forgive my diversion from plant science, but it's important. The other second, the second major trend that is occurring is urbanization. And I think I, the, the slides are fairly clear. Um, the bottom one indicating the proportion of the population that's residing in urban areas, as I said, exceeding 50% um, a couple of years back. That some of the world's biggest cities, as we project out to 25, change. You see, and as a, um, Delhi and Mumbai turning into some of the largest cities in the world, and Dakar. But the basic proportion is changing. And let me illustrate it in the context of both Afri the increasing additional billion. The 500 million extra Africans who will be there in 13 years' time will almost be entirely concentrated in cities. They will be concentrated in cities of typically about 500,000 people. That's 1,000 additional cities of 500,000 people in 13 years. In China, in, sorry, in Asia, uh, a similar trend, the only difference being it will be an urban, an addition to the urban population of the world, but that population will be living in cities of about a million people. Um, so 500 of about a million and 1,000 of about 500,000. This is a dramatic change to, the, to anything we've ever seen in the world today. And then to climate change. I said that the time delays in the system um, will actually lead to um, <coughs> something that is pretty much determined. And this is some analysis looking at the various uncertainties in terms of climate change. We've got um, the basic issue is, there's of course, some degree of model uncertainty, and the chaotic dynamics of the climate system means that there is internal variability as well. But the thing I'd like to point out to is the scenario uncertainty. The scenario uncertainty is shown in green on this, and that scenario uncertainty is, depends on whether the world community does something about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, which it hitherto has just failed to do. The successive meetings in Copenhagen, Cancun and Durban have failed to do anything in terms of legally binding agreements on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The Durban meeting has promised to uh, produce something by 2015 for implementation in 2020. It may, it may not. One of the things that is clear though, and this comes in the graph, is just whatever the scenarios are, pretty much the climate is actually going to be determined out about 2025. Now I find it quite extraordinary that in the world we live in at the moment, there are people who doubt that climate change is happening. If they look at the evidence, I find it very hard to understand how that view can be taken. Clearly, such views can be taken for um, economic or political reasons. But at the moment, I, I find it very hard to actually deal with it. But, what it. but the implications, and just let me go through, I'm, I'm going to do a sort of Cook's tour of some of the evidence. Um, one of the things, you know, for example, the Arctic sea ice loss. Um, there's two graphs here of, 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 of import. The one is the top right, showing the, uh, the decline in the average Arctic sea ice extent since 79 to last year. The other one is a similar, similar um, the bottom left is a similar seasonal pattern. The lone figure on the ice was put there for excitement. Um, somebody has a sort of sad view of excitement, I think, in my private office. But um, this is the... Um, this is some clear evidence. Now, one of the criticisms 
that comes from what, you, what uh, people who are skeptical about the issue of climate change is that scientists would say that, wouldn't they? Um, they would do that because they're all avaricious. They all want to produce an analysis, which means that their grants are continue to be funded and they live a high old life wandering around the world and uh, going to conferences and generally have it. And that is uh, a criticism that comes out from that. So if you look out from the scientific community and think to the community and think about others, one of the ones that I point to here is you can't get much more hard bitten and more uh, pragmatic than in the insurance community. And this is an analysis from the major world, the world's largest reinsurer, um, Munich Re. Um, and there, this analysis looks at the number of natural catastrophes that have occurred over the 30 years from 1980 to 2010. The red ones, bars on this histogram, are geophysical events. Earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, tsunamis even. Um, no trend. The three other aspects are meteorological events, for example, storms, hydrological events, floods, mass movements, and so on, and climatological events. Now, whereas I wouldn't, as a statistician, hang my hat on that trend line, what is very clear is whereas we're having no trend in geological events, there's a very serious trend in what is loosely associated with weather. And certainly the interpretation of that by the insurance industry and, and indeed many, many of the largest corporations in the world is that climate change is actually happening and it's a really serious business issue that has got to be addressed. This is not scientists in a sense trying to generate uh, further support by crying wolf about their organizations. These are hard bitten businessmen. Again, it's a question, one of the things that is actually put out as a claim that really this is a problem for the developing world, not for the developed world, um, and that in a sense we can afford to um, ignore it, at least for a decade or so. I think that is a pretty much a prevailing issue. But one of the, in, uh, one of the things that is happening is that is now not true. And I'm not going to talk about the, our current level of drought, which is probably well within the parameters that we see in terms of natural variability of weather. Um, but this one isn't. This is Texas. Um, the, this is shows on the y-axis, if you're those at the back, we've got the average temperature in the period uh, June to August, and on the um, x-axis, the June to August rainfall, going back for about a century with all those individual points and showing a complete cloud of what seems to be a basic relationship. And then the thing that looks like a sort of uh, pill up at the 2011 was last year's... Um, temperature and rainfall distance in Texas. Um, dramatically outside all previous patterns and in the context of food and in the context of this conference, major issues. Texas is a major supplier of food into the US economy. These are the sort of queries that I believe we have got to address and need to be thinking about as we move forward. So I have said that there are three key trends that are out there, climate change, urbanization and world population, and a fourth which is, con which is less determined but highly likely is increasing prosperity. So that generates major challenges for the food system which plant scientists have got to think about how they address. So summing it up, in terms of by 2025, 13 years away, we need vastly more food production to meet that growing population, and vastly more um, coming out of well, which needs to be done. We need to have increasing demand for food, an increasing demand for water, which I'll come on to towards the end, increasing demand for energy, and we've got climate change as a problem. Now, it wouldn't be too bad if we were starting from a situation which was reasonably adequate, but we're not. This graph is uh, fairly familiar to many people, um, but it shows the proportion of people that are hungry, i.e. do not have sufficient calories uh, of, in of energy intake when they go to bed at night to, and therefore have some degree of normal development, both physically and mentally. Add to that billion or so people who are actually in genuine food poverty, there's another billion or so who actually have significant malnutrition in their diets. And then looking at the other aspects, about just under a billion people don't 
have proper access to clean water, and actually l less talked about, but is about a little under one and a half billion who, are, who don't have access to regular and usable supplies of energy. So those are the, those are the really fundamental problems. Now, do we care? Well, the first thing to say is that we, you know, it affects us all. And the, um, uh, in 2008, when I became chief scientist, we saw the first reversal in what had been a downward trend for four decades of real uh, food prices. This is the FOAO index, which only started in 1990, but there are others showing essentially decline. 2007-8, we had the first food price spike that we'd seen since the oil crisis um, when OPEC first came four decades previously. Um, I remember when I first start, talked about this and said, well, these are major issues which are not going to go away. It was poo-pooed by um, the, the then prevailing economy, food economists saying, complete nonsense, um, the supply side will come in, your food prices are high, more crops will be planted and the price will fall. And of course it did, but the structure of the food system is extremely frail. In 2007-8, um, there was, um, we were down at uh, essentially the ratio of uh, reserves to annual consumption was 14%, about 60 days supply of food uh, for the world community as a whole. Somewhat improved, but things have changed. And the price spike in 2011 was generated by something that was rather different. Uh, food reserves had recovered somewhat, but there were massive uh, weather effects that occurred in the world. There was the biggest drought and uh, accompanied by um, wildfires in Eastern Europe. Um, wheat production in Russia and the Ukraine dropped by 30%, and they responded by, taking, uh, by actually banning exports. That, those two together, plus some serious problems in China with flooding and the horrific floods that you'll have seen on the TV in, in uh, Pakistan, all caused incidentally by exactly the same weather phenomenon, um, generated that further peak. Again, I pose the question, do we care? Do we have to care? We're a wealthy country. Um, food prices affect the poorest, the poorest in, uh, in, uh, in the UK society, as, the, as well as looking a trend globally. Um, the poorest are most affected. So do we have to care? Well, I think we do for reasons of morality and common humanity, but also some degree of self-interest. Now, this analysis is something that I wouldn't hang uh, done last year looks at the, that food price index of FAO and compares it to um, serious civil, um, civil um, uh, conflict. And the figures that are shown on that are after a country's name are the number of deaths in a particular riot or conflict. And as you can see, there is really quite a dramatic correlation between, these, between co the incidence of conflict in the developing world and the food, the food price index. Now, nobody in their right mind would claim that the riots and the, the whole behavior of what is actually constituted in the, uh, uh, in the Arab Spring is to do entirely to food prices. But actually, most of the analysis indicates that these were some of the triggers that then went into generating what was vastly civil unrest. So to an extent, we need to be thinking quite hard about how um, civil unrest can actually follow from very serious peaking of food prices. And there are complicating factors which lead to it. One of them is urbanization. Um, the fact that city dwellers and town dwellers have no real recourse to um, possible reserves of food supplies that is available to the rural poor is important, but they also have political power. So there's real issues there which are to do with the potential of a world stressed by, um, stressed by f high food prices to generate un un unrest. So what are we going to do about it? Now, there's some really hard choices. Now, looking back, um, in the past, things have been reasonably successful. This is some, some analysis that was done um, a few years back, but I think it is, a, is interesting. On the left-hand side, um, you see uh, sub-Saharan Africa, um, indexed to showing the white square, indexed in 1961. Um, that was the production. Um, 
in 1961 and increased, as you can see from the sort of pale green rectangle, um, in 2001. So 40 years, you have seen the cereal production in Africa going up by about 240, to, by a factor of 2.4, 240%. The uh, right-hand graph shows the same statistics for Asia, again indexed to 100 and going up a little more to 2.82 to in 2001 by, um, to, by a factor of 280% or so. But the way it's done is vastly different. In the case of Africa, you, it is done by increasing amounts of land going into, uh, into production in Asia it's being done primarily by increasing the yield that is occurring in those areas. And that is the real crux of a problem that we have. If I look at Africa, and the, I think Africa is, is the continent that is going to be most problematic, 500 million extra people uh, concentrated in 1,000 cities, um, what, is the, what does Africa look like? You, the deforestation rates, which is shown on the left graph, are um, you don't get much deforestation in a desert anyway, so the, um, but the key ones where there is significant amounts of forest uh, are showing in red. Um, but also the vulnerability to desertification is shown on the right-hand side. Again, uh, all the sort of things that one might reasonably expect. But look at the bottom figures. This is the amount of land available per person. Um, and what you're looking at is really almost a factor of 10 um, in the century. Clearly, these projections can produce some degree of spurious accuracy. But major changes in the amount of arable land um, that is going to be available um, for within Africa, even on, um, per person. And so what it points to is an enormous need for sustainable intensification of agriculture. These, this is a figure from a, repo, uh, a report that I commissioned from my, the Foresight team on the future of food and farming, um, uh, chaired by uh, Charles Godfrey from Oxford. And these are some of the key points about the fact that essentially we need to be thinking about it. The current food system is unsustainable. Um, I'll come to water in a moment, but 70% of total global water goes into agriculture. About uh, about 24% of, uh, of soils have been actually degraded, and also agriculture, and I'll come on to this again, is a significant producer of greenhouse gas emissions. So what is going to be needed is sustainable intensification. Um, the bottom right-hand graph shows the sort of issue that shows the graph of arable land over time. And if we were in the 20th century, what we would see uh, as we address these types of problems was is a major expansion of arable land, the ploughing up of grassland, the cutting down of forests to produce um, farming land. And we, that is no longer possible. So we need to be thinking about a transition to sustainable agriculture. And one of the key problems about the problem that we face now is that because of that pressure to increase, agri increase agricultural production, um, that is going to interact with the issues of greenhouse gas emissions. And I've recently um, finished chairing an international commission on climate change and agric agriculture and food security. I want to take a little while to say this. First of all, we want global food production to be somewhere in a region that we don't have vast poverty. We don't have um, major issues of, of, um, dis of inequality, so that there is a large, we may produce enough food, but there's a large, a large proportion of the world population doesn't get it. At the same time, we want to be thinking about uh, climate change, and we need to be thinking, and one of the sort of useful statistics is to be thinking about um, mean warming. So one of the ways that, we, and this is no more, this is not a graph, it's more a cartoon, is to think about where we are at present. Well, at present, we are in where the, the um, black dot is, and where we would like to be is it in somewhere where our food production is sufficient to um, meet the requirements of, of this growing and er, growing the urbanized population. And at the same time, we, don't, we want to be in a situation where climate change doesn't go out of control. And 
The problem we have is that we actually do need to be thinking about agricultural production in a way that is, fre that is re seriously reducing the level of greenhouse gas emissions. Because if we actually in continue to apply current agricultural practices, what that is going to do and the, and the left-hand isocline is that as we increase food production using the same techniques that, and the same uh, set of plants and animals that we currently use, you're going to, as you move towards that safe space for food production, you're moving towards something which is going to generate a serious problem in terms of greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural sector. And on current projections, we get the worst of all possible worlds. The sort of open circle in the middle on the right-hand side is the sort of projection that one would make very loosely, and these are quite simple models, um, about where we are likely to end up, i.e. slightly insufficient food and uh, a significant problem of greenhouse gas emissions. And you can put that into uh, t terms you're rather more familiar. So we can think about a couple of major crops, wheat and maize. This is some analysis that the US um, DA put, it, put together and indicated the general average yield of, in, of wheat and maize, two key crops, uh, and the anticipated demand from FAO. Now again, spurious accuracy, beware of it, um, but that anticipated demand could be a little higher, could be a little lower, but it's certainly significantly above any trend lines that you're observing in terms of the increase in yield per hectare that we've seen in the 50 years to 2010. And remember, because of these other considerations to do with climate change, uh, apart from bio, uh, major issues of biodiversity, that's got to be achieved with uh, out major increases in fertilizer and pesticide use. Um, so that's the real difficulty. Now, how have we fared thus far? Um, well, actually, to an extent, um, things have not been too bad. This is, uh, I think, uh, I, I almost uh, am embarrassed to mention uh, Rothamsted in the, uh, with Dale Sanders present, and I'll, I'll, uh, bring, I'll, I'm prepared to do so and take my courage in my hand. Um, but so I, we have actually seen, um, and this is a group, graph that was prepared by Rothamsted, of the way in which yields have actually gone up. Uh, we've actually done pretty well. But as you can see, if we look at the uh, wheat yields, um, shown in the black dots, it's, that increase has been flattening off quite significantly, as indeed uh, once, when one looked at, the, at rice, in a similar way, things have actually been um, stagnating recently. So there's a real problem there in terms of science and technology and changing farming practice has actually improved things historically, but as you saw from the previous graph, there's going to be a need, a very significant need, to increase that yield in a sustainable way. Um, and it's going to be tough. Climate change, as I said, is happening. This, for example, I'm focusing a lot on Africa because I think that's where many of the problems are going to be. This is the likely decline in growing season, um, done by uh, an analysis done by Thornton and his colleagues. Um, and we're looking at the loss, potential loss, in the growing period. Um, as you move from sub-Saharan Africa down in, significant changes in growing period with, with therefore resultant problems for, um, for it. Um, but there's real potential there. Um, the Foresight study I alluded to looked at the agricultural potential in Africa and there is a lot of very good land there. But management is going to be uh, important. The Foresight study indicated some cause for hope. Um, in terms of the, uh, the potential that could be done if one actually used different agricultural practice and focused on it. But there's some big problems. One of them is nitrogen fertilizer. 2% um, of all fossil fuels, energy is used for nitrogen fixation and fertilizer production. And we've got a real problem in terms of Afri African agriculture. Can we do it with less fertilizer? 
Can one increase those yields um, in Africa, which is clearly a country where there is, an, where there is under usage of nitrogen? There's a problem of overuse of it um, in China and, and India in parts. Um, but in Africa and in many parts of the world, you are, you're looking at a need for more nitrogen. Now, this is one of the obvious challenges for the plant community, plant science community, is can one actually think, develop uh, strains of, uh, of plants which can actually operate efficiently with significantly less fertilizer production? Because both the, there's both an economic thing, price of fertilizer is extremely high, uh, clearly cor basically correlated with the oil price. Um, three years ago, the oil price was $40 a barrel, it's, and, it's about 135 now, likely to go up, highly vulnerable. Fertilizer will follow it with the concomitant problems. So those are the sort of issues. So in terms of plant science, um, what are we going to need? Um, we're going to need a whole series of different um, practices and different behaviours. We need to be thinking about uh, different varieties and types of crops. We need to be thinking about diversity, um, agroecosystem analysis, can, to bring in agroforestry, can actually be a climate smart agriculture that can actually sequester carbon dioxide. We need to be thinking about the quality of feed for livestock. Livestock are a major emitter. If we can get plants that actually alter the diet composition, we'll get less production of greenhouse gases. There's issues to do with soil management and so on. So big issues here that need to be addressed. And then waste. This again comes from the Foresight Report. Um, in terms of the problem of pests and diseases, there's an irony which I'll draw just briefly on that give or take about 30% of um, food produced in the developing world is lost before harvest. Um, in the, UK, in um, the developed world, about 30% is lost after purchase. But focusing on the developing world, about 40% because there's post-harvested losses. This is the proportional losses in the top right hand. So it's slightly dated analysis, but, I don't, but not really changed, showing somewhere between 30 and 40% of crops are actually lost due to pests and diseases. Massive potential here for um, plant science to actually affect that, whether it in fact it is in, um, is in having plants that are resistant to disease or, pe or to pest attack, or indeed plants whose seeds are resistant to attack during storage. Now, I, um, I'm mentioning Rothamsted again to infuriate Dale, but uh, many of you have seen, and the press has been, uh, has been highlighting in the last few week, a few days, actually, um, the work of John Pickett and his colleagues, uh, in which they've um, been, use, been transforming um, um, wheat by taking a I think they've called it in the press the, a peppermint gene, uh, which, I'll, uh, which I'm happy to use, to actually promote um, pheromone attract pheromones that both attract natural predators and actually um, alarm aphids potentially enormously important we have a real issue here that there is that this type of development um, has got massive critic criticism from very very small groups who somehow feel this endangers now I am quite as Dale mentioned it earlier I am not someone who says that um, GM crops will be a silver bullet and solve the food security problem, but the idea that one a priori, one excludes a technology that could deliver massive benefits like this because it involves genetically modified organisms seems to me to be unacceptable. We've got to have health, we've got to have check safety and health, we've got to check safety in terms of environmental impact. But once those are done, we should not be thinking a priori doing it. We have a problem in Europe because it is a political issue unlikely to change. In the developing world, the developing world is crying out for assistance in terms of this, in terms of having better plants that actually can drive the problem forward. The final challenge I want to talk to is water. You can't have plants without water, uh, even I know that. And the, and the big challenge in terms of irrigation, I don't have time to talk about it, but um, I was talking at Oxford last night to a, um, a conference on water security. And one of the really terrifying things that I think at the moment is the enormous amount of uh, water that is used for irrigation that comes from aquifers. 
Um, India in particular is problematic, but it also applies to the USA to, and many other parts of the world in which aquifers are being used to provide irrigation. Typically, you can get in some areas of northwest India uh, um, water that is aged several hundred years old being used for irrigation, meaning that essentially the dynamics of the water are being exploited where there's effectively um, no recruitment of new water in and that the age of water in the aquifers is dying is um, increasing all the time, which indicates major over-exploitation, something we need to look at. Taken as a whole, and water is something that is really enormously important, the current projections of a gap between water supply and demand, as we project out to the 2030, um, 17 years, 18 years away, is 40%. So again, a massive challenge to the plant science community to develop both agricultural practices but also plants that need significantly less water to, water to grow. This is, I think, the, the interaction between water, um, food and climate are going to be the major drivers that, that are challenges to the plant science community. So to complete, these are the challenges. A billion more people major increases in the concentration of people in cities, a more prosperous world f coming on it, and climate change coming in as a very significant risk multiplier. So an overall, an increased vulnerability to shocks and pressures. And we need to, and this is where your community can develop, not necessarily in high tech, but in thinking about rare breeds and making certain that we can actually understand how plants live within their ecosystems, how we can actually think about the science of agroecology. We need that. We need the ability to improve our resilience to these pressures. We need to improve, improve increase food um, production without an increase in greenhouse gases. We need to somehow make more water available. And again, agriculture is using 70% of available water. And uh, the energy technologies I haven't covered, but obviously there's a whole issue of biofuels. So cheerful little talk, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks for your attention. Um, I, I, have, uh, I can take th possibly two and maybe even three questions. If they're really irritating questions, I'll only take one. Who wants to speak? Anyone? And Hi. say your name and place Sorry. again. Uh, Nick Ossell from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. Um, I, I think one of the big issues that we're interested in uh, with the Research Council at NERC is how to make this balance between production and greenhouse gas emissions. You say is one of your points there that we need to not increase greenhouse gas emissions but increase production of mm. food. Is that, re is that really possible, do you think? Well, I think that we have to hope it is. Yeah. Um, the, some of the, the this International Commission on Climate Change and Agriculture that I chaired came forward with this idea, which we took to the Durban summit, on new, thinking about investing in what would be climate smart agriculture. There's two ways of it. One is that agriculture, which is actually um, using less greenhouse gases, gases during its production for the same yield, and that I think is really possible. And I think plant breeding can can make a big contribution to that. The second one is terms to what you might call agroecology in which the, uh, you can actually use plants types that actually will sequester carbon dioxide in the soil, but also, for example, with some sort of agroforestry systems where you actually do get further sequestration and improvement in prof yields. Potential, actually, for poor farmers in the developing world is quite exciting, particularly, and this was the thing we failed in Durban to get agreed, but it's moving forward, is if there, some of the significant funding that is actually going into climate change mitigation and adaptation um, could be used in the agricultural sector so so that, in a sense, a farmer would be paid for sequestering carbon dioxide. So they would get some modest profit increase in profit from the actual practice, but then they would get a payment because they're actually sequestering carbon dioxide under, the, under some form of climate change um, payment system. So that's a hope, and I hope we can do it. It's, I can't pretend it's not a formidable challenge. Thanks. Yeah, you, a lady in the middle there. Uh, hi, Elaine Jensen from IBERS in Aberystwyth University. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, this may be slightly off, off topic, but I wondered how much uh, effort, I suppose, uh, the government is putting into looking at behavioural change mm -hmm. um, and interacting with... Yeah, it's, good. it's a good question, and it's not really off topic. Um, I think the uh, behavioural change is extraordinarily difficult. 
Um, one of the things, you know, I would say if you point to some successes in behavioral change, I'd point to the ban on smoking, where essentially, um, who would have said 10 years ago that smoking in a public place would now be banned and, you know, riots were not, not occurring. I think there's some significant changes in the way in which people have been thinking about uh, car safety. I think drunken driving happens, but it's now an unacceptable practice. When I was at 20, it was sort of a common life. This was your lifestyle. But uh, I, so I think there are some behavior changes that is has improved. I think there is some behavioural change too in terms of waste. I think that the retailers can be extremely, can extremely helpful in this, con in this context. And I think that we need to be thinking in terms of greenhouse gas um, usage. I think that we will be seeing over the next decade or so um, a view of, for example, on water use. That water use is going to be seen as something that has got to be done rather carefully. Um, where there is already the concept of virtual water. Um, we import large amounts of cotton, for example, from countries that are extremely uh, um, poor in the, in the amount of their water supplies. So therefore, in a sense, we are getting a subsidy of our own water supplies. I also think, quite frankly, that um, within the UK, there is going to be a real serious local problem with water. Um, I, I did say in, earlier on that, I, that the current drought we're, think, we're observing is well within the natural variation of weather as we've measured it. But the, a study that DEFRA did on climate change threats over the next 20 or 30 years showed that all, all uh, UK river, uh, all K in English river basins will be in deficit by the 2020s, and some of them severely so. We're going to have to think about water in a very, very different way. Historically, it's been effectively a free good. That certainly isn't the case now, um, but we're going to be thinking about it. So, those, so we are thinking about behavioural change. One of the words, simple ones, for example, the Department of Energy and Climate Change have pointed out is just things like um, having the ambient temperature of your home down by one or two degrees would make a major difference on it. Now, there will be, a, be economic incentives. There can, be, and there can actually be, in a sense, moral or societal uh, incentives. So these are there. Um, it is hard, though. It really is quite a difficult problem to actually generate behavioural change. But, to an ex but we, you know, it's important and you're quite right to raise it. I can take one more question, then I run out of time into Sandy Knapp's talk, I think. Or no, Professor Mott's talk. One more. No? Great. Over to you, the next speaker. Thank you.